family and friends, good to have you with us tonight, and I trust that you are excited about the evening. It is a wonderful uh, Wednesday, and I am certainly glad to be here with you and to be able to share God's word once again. And so I just want to say good evening to everyone and welcome, and I invite you to like and to share this broadcast. I think that uh, you're going to be pleased with the Bible study tonight. We're going to be looking at the book of First Kings. And so we've been having a wonderful time exploring the Bible. And as we're going through it, uh, hopefully my goal is that you're getting to see a greater picture of how the Bible comes together, how some of the characters and some of those prophets and priests and teachers and leaders, how they lived and how their lives all connect to the coming of the Christ. And so we are just uh, excited about being here with you, and I want to encourage you, again, uh, text somebody, share this. Uh, I want to get the word out to as many people as we can. I'm trying to get these, uh, get the numbers up so that we can make sure that people are getting the solid word. In this day and time, as never before, we need to have a solid word from the Lord. Uh, there's a lot of things that are going on in the world today. But to have a comprehensive understanding of God's plan and God's word is so important and so needed. I see many of you joining, uh, Sister April, Connie, Sister Pat, Angela, Sister Fran, uh, Tora, um, oh, and Sister Sylvia. So many of you that are coming in, thank you for uh, joining. And again, uh, invite your loved ones, your family, your friends, those who want a deeper understanding of uh, just having the word of God. So. Get your Bibles, uh, get your commentaries, get your highlighters out. We're going to be going through the scripture tonight, and I trust that as we highlight these points, that you will be blessed as we explore the Word of God together. So let's get into it, and uh, let's make it happen. God, we pray tonight that you will bless us once again, and that you'll open the portals of our hearts, our minds, and even our understanding that we may be able to comprehend your will for our lives as we go forward. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, we're looking forward to, again, uh, enjoying this night, this time over the next 30 minutes or so. And uh, again, as I shared with you, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to, this is our 11th lesson, turn with me to the book of First Kings, the book of First Kings. And in the book of First Kings, uh, you, we're going to explore uh, some concepts tonight that will add to your uh, repository of wisdom and knowledge. Also, if you are uh, enjoying this, please uh, consider supporting our Wednesday night Bible study. You can do that one of the four ways that are online and just make a note. Uh, put WB, Wednesday night Bible study. We, know what it, we, we will know what it means. So just uh, do that. And uh, you, you share whatever gift the Lord lays on your heart. Okay. In this book of uh, second, uh, First Kings, we are going to study the life and the reign of Solomon. As you know, last week we left off and we began, we left off with the life of David ending and Solomon coming on as king. And so Solomon is David's son and he's a successor to the throne of Israel. The kingdom of David and Solomon, and here, catch this, the kingdom of David and Solomon was a political phenomena without any match in the middle history of the Middle East. And although their kingdom did not encompass as much land as some of the great empires like Egypt and Assyria and Babylon, in their greatest days, David and Solomon were the strongest rulers of their era. They had the greatest impact during their era. So David extended the borders of the kingdom as we looked at the map last week, but it was Solomon who developed the economic prosperity. So even though David increased land mass, it was Solomon who increased the prosperity of it. And so I want to read this passage of scripture uh, in 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 23. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but I want you to capture this. Here's a passage. It says, King Solomon far exceeded all the earth's kings in wealth and wisdom. And so the whole earth, watch this, 
everybody on the planet wanted an audience with Solomon in order to hear his God-given wisdom. God had granted Solomon with the wisdom and people came from far and near to hear what he had to share and what he had to say. And so his wealth exceeded all of the kings of the nation. This was the golden age of fine arts in Israel. Several of the books of the Old Testament were written during Solomon's reign. Uh, the book of Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. And we're going to study all of those. But the worship of God, the worship of Jehovah, reached an all-time high during the reign of, da of David and Solomon. And that, that worship, that, that, that respect, that honor, that uh, hunger for God, has yet to ever be excelled or exceeded and has never been attained again. So during their reign, there was a tremendous uh, a hunger and a tremendous uh, a commitment to serving God. But however, and here's the caution, in the midst of the prosperity during Solomon's rule, things started to fall apart around him. Things started to disintegrate as, as, as it happens in life. And you may say, well, why, Bishop? Again, I'm going to get a little bit ahead of myself. But we're going to come back and go a little deeper into this. But if you have your Bibles, turn with me quickly to 1 Kings chapter 11. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 4 because I want you to understand what happened that caused uh, the kingdom of, of the United Kingdom of Israel to begin to disintegrate. What took place? Well, Let's read this passage. In 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 1 through 4, Solomon had married, as we know, Pharaoh's daughter. But listen, King Solomon, the Bible says, loved many foreign women, including the Moabites, uh, the Ammonites, the Edomites, and the Sidonians, and the Hittites. These came from the nations that the Lord had commanded the Israelites about. So God had warned uh, uh, Israel about these, these particular groupings of people. And this is what he said, don't intermarry with them. They will definitely turn your heart toward their gods. Solomon clung to these women in love. Here, here's the amazing fact. This is what happened. He had 700 royal wives and 300 secondary wives, and they turned his heart. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. He wasn't committed to the Lord, his God, with all of his heart as his father David was. So this began the downfall of Israel, of the United Kingdom, I should say. Now, what happened? He married these, these women who were considered pagans at that time, who turned his heart from God uh, towards other gods. He, he failed to recognize what God had done to get Israel to where they were. So let's, let's look at what we're going to talk about tonight uh, briefly. It was just two, two, I broke this book up into two portions. So here's the portions that we're going to look at tonight. We're going to talk about the reign of Solomon in chapters 1 through 11, and then we're going to look at the divided kingdom. What caused the kingdom to be divided? That's the direction that we're moving in. So the reign, the reign of Solomon <clears throat> is our first point. As this book opens, uh, we find King David is now an old man and he's bedridden. His son Adonijah decided that he should become the king. So remember, David, David has several sons, and we talked about them last, last week. He had, he had uh, s uh, seven sons, I believe we talked about last week. And so Adonijah decided that he should be the king, and he gave a party uh, to celebrate this his coming into. Uh, but hearing about this, Bathsheba, Bath Bathsheba, who was Solomon's mother, went to King David and reminded him of his promise that Solomon, her son, was to be king. So Nathan the prophet goes and he confirms with David that. Uh, uh, Adonijah is planning to take over the kingdom. So David immediately does something. He crowns Solomon and he anoints him as the king of Israel. 
So let's read that passage of scripture there in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 39. So if you got your Bibles, turn there, highlight this. So what happens? Zadok the priest took the horn of oil from the tent and he anointed Solomon. Then he blew the ram's horn. See, what, what, what was taking place? He blew the ram's horn, which alerted, even though Adonijah had, had created a party to celebrate him becoming king, when the priest, who was the official authority, identified that David had anointed Solomon, they blew the ram's horn, which alerted the entire surrounding that Solomon was king, and the people said, long live King Solomon. So the people understood who the legitimate and official king was. And then when Adonijah saw this opposition, he gave up and said, hey, no need in me fighting against the authority or the power. And he accepted that. Now, after David's final words to his son Solomon, David succumbed. He died ending his reign of 40 years. So for 40 years, he ruled what, again, I keep using this word and I want you to let that sink in. He ruled the United Kingdom because remember, David had, had come in and he had taken over and he had began to the process of bringing all of the all of the land, the land mass together as one and they became a United Kingdom and not a divided kingdom. But here's the, David's final words to Solomon, his charge to Solomon. Go to 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 2 through 4. Here's what David said to Solomon. He said, now I'm following the path that the whole world or the whole earth takes. In essence, he told his son, I'm about to die. I'm leaving. But here's, here's what I want you to do. I want you to be strong and be a man. Guard what is owned to the Lord your God, walking in his ways and observing his laws, his commands, his judgments, his testimonies, just as it is written in the instruction from Moses. In this way, watch this, in this way you will succeed in whatever you do and wherever you go. So also the Lord will confirm the wor word he spoke to me. If your children will take care to walk before me faithfully with all of their hearts and all of their being, then one of your children will never fail to be on the throne of Israel. So God gives this command through David to his son and says, listen, be strong, and I want you to follow the precepts of the Lord. He gave him the directions, gave him the instructions, gave him, I'm going to put that scripture back up because I want to emphasize one part there. He says, walking in his ways and observing his laws. Why, why, why do you think that was important? Well, that was important because David understood that as you begin to amass, as you begin to come out of uh, tough times and you begin to walk into times of uh, prosperity and upward mobility, people tend to forget God. Now, that's a lesson that we need to learn today and, 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 and be sure that you and I, that part of our responsibility is to recognize that the church, the gospel, that which we love and we adore, that's what, which we honor God, it all belongs to God. Our resources belong to God. Our material possessions belong to God. Our Everything we have, it belongs to God. And, and David was reminding Solomon, don't forget, you are blessed because of those that went before you and you are partaking of those blessings. Now keep the laws intact. Keep the things that got you here intact. Well, God appears to Solomon. Let's move on. He appears to Solomon. Go to chapter 3, uh, verse uh, 9. He appears to Solomon uh, in a dream early in his reign, and God tells Solomon, listen, you can have anything you want. Can you imagine God coming to you and, uh, and saying, Ask me for anything. Whatever you want, just ask and you can have it. It can belong to you. It can be yours. And so he asks, he says, what would you have? First Kings chapter three, verse nine. Please highlight this in your Bibles. This is what Solomon said. He said, please give your servant 
a discerning mind. Now, God had said you can have anything, riches, power, land. He didn't tell him what he could have. He said anything, anything is anything. And this is what Solomon asked for, a discerning mind in order to govern your people and to distinguish good from evil because no one is able to govern this important people of yours without your help. He said, God, most important thing I want is you. Can I say that to us tonight? The most important thing in our hearts should be to serve God. To say, God, I, I thank you for the, the blessings that you bestowed upon me. I thank you for the opportunities you've given me. I thank you for the uplift that you've given me, for the challenges that you've brought me through. But God, I need your wisdom to guide me. That was Solomon's prayer. Solomon then, as a result of that, Let's continue. He became the wisest man the world would ever see until the coming of the one who is greater. Uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 42. We, we won't go there. But he became the wisest man until Jesus came on to the scene because he had asked God, bless me with wisdom. Can I pray that prayer for us tonight? Lord, grant us your wisdom. Grant us, God, the ability to discern, to discern between good and evil. Grant us, God, the ability to know your will for our lives. God, that's our prayer, that you would help us, God, no matter what uh, life may give unto us, give us your wisdom. You know, I think when we get God's wisdom, we can flourish in everything that we do. But one of Solomon's first wise, wise not wives, wise, W-I-S-E, moves was to put together a cabinet of wise officers of state. In essence, Solomon set up a system of government, each having their own department that they were responsible for. Now, this led to great prosperity in the kingdom. However, the greatest accomplishment of Solomon, which will never be will never go unnoticed and it is unparalleled in history, was the building of the temple. In chapter 6, it gives the whole all of the details. And we don't have time to go through all of that tonight. But you read chapter 6. It gives you all of the, 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 the timber and the gold and all of the ornate stones and everything that went into the temple. You'll, you'll, you'll find there in chapter 6. That This was what his father David had dreamed of doing, but God said, no, your son will do it. The great foundation stones, which uh, were, were the, the foundation for Solomon's temple that he built, are still intact today. Those foundation stones are still in Israel today. Uh, the temple was built later by Zerubbabel and Herod, and, they, and it was constructed on the exact same spot. And from that spot in the ninth century, it, it, it's, it's taught that uh, Muhammad was supposed to have been transported to heaven. So for the last 1,000 years, the Muslims have occupied that sacred parcel of land. Today, that parcel of land is called the Dome of the Rock. That's where Solomon's temple stood at the Dome of the Rock. Let me show you a picture of it. It's right there in Israel. It's at the highest elevation there. And that is the Dome of the Mark. It's Dome of the Rock. Inside that building is the rock that is the foundation stone, one of the foundation stones for the temple that was built for the house, the Ark of the Covenant. So it's right there. And listen, here is that rock that's inside that, that dome, and it's housed there as a monument. And that same stone is the stone that it said that that's the stone where uh, Abraham placed Isaac. Uh, that's what history tells us. It's the stone where Solomon's tem temple was, was built upon. And here's an interesting fact that I want to share with you. That stone, uh, uh, several decades, a couple decades ago, uh, Dr. Nat and I uh, visited Israel, and we actually went into the Dome of the Rock right there. And uh, we actually had the opportunity to walk around and go inside. And uh, I remember reaching over and placing my hands on that rock. 
What a powerful experience. I still still recall that that I was able to reach in and touch the rock. It, 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 it was it was a moment that that really impacted me because I said, God, this is the rock where the temple that was constructed to hold how your presence stood. And God, I had my hands on that. And the, the same rock where you established uh, your, your power and your authority. So the huge stones, uh, the beautiful cedar wood that was in the temple, the gold coverings made Solomon's temple uh, probably the most beautiful in all of history. Now, there was something unusual about that, 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 that temple, though, that took place in the construction of it. And I want to share this scripture. Go to six, uh, chapter 6, verse 7 in 1 Kings, and let's read that scripture together. It says, when the temple was built, they did all the stone cutting at the quarry. Yeah, now watch this. There were no hammers, axes, or any iron tools were heard in the temple during its construction. There was such a reverence for God that they did not even allow the construction tools on the job site. Everything was built, everything was fabricate, fabricated outside of the temple and then brought into the temple and put in place. What a powerful, powerful example that here God says, my presence will dwell in this place. Be holy because I'm holy. Now, at first, Solomon's reign went really well. Everything was raining roses for him. Everything was going beautifully for him. But later, he began to weigh down his people, the same people that we read the scripture with uh, just a few minutes ago, where he said, Lord, give me a discerning heart to know how to lead your people. Something shifted in Solomon's life. Something changed in his leadership. It's important that you stay connected to godly leadership. I, 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 you know, in this day and time as never before, let me say this to you, uh, make sure that you are connected in a good church. If, if C3 is not your church, find a good church where you're getting solid teaching, not just entertainment, not just feeling good, but you're getting a solid word. You're being taught uh, because, see, see, from a leader who's asking God for the wisdom to direct his people, Solomon started off, and many people start off on the right track. Solomon started off on the right track. But something happened. The kingdom began to disintegrate. What happened? His famous temple, his beautiful palace, uh, it, it, what's a good word? It bedazzled, that's the word. It, it bedazzled all of his subjects, all of the foreign visitors. But here's the key. Here's, here's the thing. It cost a whole, 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 whole lot of money to do that. And the burden of taxation to pay for these things fell on the people, and it became almost unbearable to them. And so the seeds of unrest and uh, revolution were being planted because people were like, we're being taxed too much. We're getting overly taxed, and we, we just can't make it. And so Solomon had begun to put taxes on the people to 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 create all of this lavishness that he had uh, he had accumulated with the temple and then his lifestyle, the 700 wives and the 300 100, uh, secondary wives or concubines, as the Old Testament says. And so it, it took a lot of money to make that happen. And where was he getting it from? He was getting it from the people. So in chapter 9 and 10, we find Solomon has reached the pinnacle of his career. Now, according to chapter 10, verse 21 and 23, I want you to see how lavish that uh, Solomon lived. Now, 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 let's go there. Go to chapter 10, verse 21 and 23. Let's read that. Uh, check this out. All of kings, this, this is how lavish he was living. All of King Solomon's drinking cups were made of gold, and all of the items in the forest of Lebanon's palace were made of pure gold, not silver, since even silver wasn't considered good enough in Solomon's time. The royal fleet of Tarshish-style ships was at the sea with Haram's fleet, returning once every three years with a shipment of gold, silver, 
ivory, monkeys, peacocks. King Solomon far exceeded all of the kings in wealth and wisdom. Solomon was bawling, as our young folk would say. He was making it happen. He was living large. Uh, but he did that uh, in, in the beginning to honor God. He, he, he wanted to create a temple that nothing but the very, very best. And I, I believe that, that we should give God our best. So God's, God's temple was, was, the walls were overlaid with pure gold. Uh, everything inside, the, the cedar was covered by gold. Everything was pure gold. So, uh, And he did that to honor God, but he also lived this lavish lifestyle. So Solomon set up uh, uh, something important that happened, and, and, and we find it in that scripture. He was, the first, he was the initiator of setting up the first international shipping system. So he, he built a navy that could go back and bring gold and silver. And you saw peacocks and monkeys and spices. Uh, it, it reached places that people never had any clue that, that existed. But he was the uh, uh, initiator of that to make that happen. So he set up that system. But he also set up tax districts that did not correspond with the 12 tribal distri districts that made up uh, the United Kingdom. And although it was accepted during Solomon's reign, this, this little discrepancy of taxation uh, began to create dissension between the northern and the southern uh, parts of Israel during, uh, during that time. And at Solomon's death, it really created a, a, a division among the two. So to add to the problem, Solomon had made, uh, as, as we said earlier, he had, he had many political marriages with foreign women uh, to ensure that there would be peace and security within the foreign nations. So that was one of the things they would do. They would marry a, 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 a woman from another country or another nation, and that way they would be family and they wouldn't war, uh, be at war with one another. So Solomon had, had all of these political marriages as well. And so these wives brought with them their pagan religions, and they paved the way of apostasy uh, of Solomon and his people. They, it paved the way of them pulling back or pulling away from God. I hope I'm not going too fast and you're, you're catching just an overview of this. And you can read this book for yourself. And I hope every week you're reading the entire book to get a, to get a deeper understanding. But go to chapter 11. And let's look at verses 3 and 8. Let's, let's go there. Chapter 11, verse 3 and 8. He had 700 royal wives, 300 secondary wives. They turned his heart. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. He wasn't committed to the Lord his God with all of his heart as his father David. Solomon fo followed Astarte, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Malcolm, the detestable God of the Amorites. And Solomon did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord and wasn't completely devoted to the Lord like his father David. On the hill of east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a shrine to Chemosh, the detestable God of Moab, and to Molech, the detestable God of the Ammonites. He did the same for all of his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrifice to their gods. There was a price that came along with Solomon uh, acquiring all of this wealth. It was compromise. He had to compromise to in order to sustain everything that he had been doing. So towards the end of Solomon's life, uh, there began among the northern tribes the, the signs of revolution. People were saying, hey, we're not taking this anymore. We, we, we're overtaxed. Uh, we're burdened. Uh, it's difficult to live. Uh, we, 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 we're, losing, we're losing our focus. And during this time, God spoke to Ahijah, a, a young man uh, named Jer Jeroboam. So he spoke to this prophet, and, and, and he spoke to this young man named Jeroboam. And he told, the, he told Jeroboam, he said, listen, because of what Solomon is doing, remember, how many tribes? There were 12 tribes 
that encompassed and made up Israel. But here, uh, Jeroboam was informed by the prophet. He said, you are going to rule 10 of the tribes and God is taking the other, those 10 away from Solomon because of his apostasy. God's taking it away. One of the things that I don't want to happen is that we lose any ground that we've gained in our generation because our children and our grandchildren uh, have turned away from God. And that's why every, every week I, I share that it's important that you and I share our stories with them. Uh, remember, we are legacy makers and curse breakers. Legacy makers, because we want them to know the story. And they may say, oh, grandma, grandpa, oh, mom, oh, dad. That, that, that's old school. Yeah, but that's what got you to where you are now. That's why you're able to enjoy the lifestyle that you're enjoying now. So I need you to understand it was God. Solomon failed to do that. And so when Solomon heard of this, when he heard that Jeroboam uh, was going to be, uh, was, was being elevated, and he was going to take these these, 12, these 10 tribes, uh, he sought to kill him. Look in, look in uh, Kings, 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 40 and 43. This is what happens. Let's read the scripture together. Then Solomon tried to kill Jeroboam. But Jeroboam fled to Egypt and its king Shishak. Jeroboam remained in Egypt until Solomon died. Solomon's remaining days, the rest of Solomon's deeds, including all his wisdom, aren't they written in the official records of Solomon? The amount of time Solomon ruled over all of Israel and Jerusalem was 40 years, just like his father David. And Solomon lay down with his ancestors. He was buried in his father's David's city. And Rehoboam, his son, succeeded him as king. So now, now we have Jeroboam and we have Rehoboam. So Rehoboam is Solomon's son. He takes over. And that brings us to the second portion in these next few minutes that we're going to look at. Chapters 12 through 22, very quickly. Uh, he... This brings us into the point of the division of the kingdom. So remember, there's a united kingdom, but now this brings us to the point of the division. After Solomon died, his son Rehoboam went to Sheshem to be crowned the king of Israel. When Jeroboam heard of, when Jeroboam heard, let see, Rehoboam was Solomon's son. Jeroboam was the one who the prophet told would get the 10 tribes so when Jeroboam heard of Solomon's death, he returned to Israel and led the people of the north to ask Rehoboam for relief from the heavy taxes and the forced labor. So he tried to go to him and say, hey, let's negotiate this. Let's work this out. So Jeroboam goes to Solomon's son, Rehoboam, and says, listen, the people are under oppression, these heavy taxes, this forced labor. Uh, you, you've enslaved them, basically. He says, can we have some relief? So Rehoboam gets his counselors together, who were all, he had, he had rejected the older counselors <laughs> and, and got all young men like himself and didn't have any seasoned people on his team. And after counseling with his advisors for three days, what did he do? Look at chapter 12, verses 12 through 14. I want you to see what, what he did because in the multitude of counselors is safety, but make sure that you include some seasoned counselors in that multitude. Don't think that they don't know anything. This is what happens. Let's look at the scripture. So Jeroboam and all of the people returned to Rehoboam on the third day, just as the king had specified when he said, come back to me in three days. Here was his answer. The king answered harshly. Rehoboam said, listen, he ignored the elders' advice and instead followed the young people's advice. So those who were seasoned had told him, take it easy, lighten up a little bit. But the young people that were with him said, no, no, make it harder. He said, my father made your workload heavy, but I'll make it even heavier. My father disciplined with whips, but I'll do it with scorpions. He created a havoc that created civil war. So when Jeroboam and the northern tribes heard this, they declared their independence and said, We're, hey, no more. 
you do you, we're going to do us, and they set up their own kingdom. Now here, let me show the map quickly. So all of this land here, look, look at this, all of this land from here all the way down, all the way around, all of this was the land that David and Solomon had accumulated. When, when this happened, there was a division. So it became a northern kingdom, which was Israel. And the capital of Israel was Samaria, right here. And then the southern kingdom would have been Judah. And the capital of Judah was Jerusalem. So Judah consisted of the tribe of Judah, a part of the tribe of Benjamin, and eventually the tribe of Simeon. So that's what that's what encompasses Judah here, this this great this orange area here. And it absorbs the tribe of Benjamin and Simeon into its into its uh, uh, domain. Now, almost all of the territory under the reign of David was lost. What happened? They lost all of the. They lost Philistia. It separated. It was no longer a part. They lost Ammon. It was no longer a part. They lost Syria, Aram. That's Syria. They lost. Uh, 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 Phoenicia. So they, they lost all of this because they could not come together. They were, they were not, they were divided. So this caused severe consequences for Israel and Judah, because when they lost this, what happens? They also lost the revenue or the taxes that were coming. So all of these outlying states were paying taxes to Israel or Judah. They were getting paid. Uh, from all of these people. Now, when they separated, they lost that. They lost their tax base. And in chapter 17, so well, before I go there, the once great kingdom of Israel became two uh, smaller states uh, assessing a little less land than when Israel first went in from the promised land being led in by Joshua. All of their gains have been lost, and they now have been become a divided kingdom, no longer the united kingdom. Well, let's wrap this up. My time is right there on the edge. In chapter 17 through 22, something shifts happen. It's a shift happens because there's new leadership in the two kingdoms, Jeroboam, Rehoboam. But now the prophet Elijah comes into play. The name Elijah means Jehovah is my God, and that fits him perfectly because if there was ever a prophet that was sold out to God, it was Elijah. And so he was one of the most outstanding prophets and is spoken more of in the New Testament than any other prophet. It was Elijah who appeared before Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17, verse 3, and we'll get there down the road. But there were two highlights that I wanted to mention in Elijah's ministry. The first was found in uh, 1 Kings chapter 17 and 1. And I was going to read the scriptures, but for the sake of time, you go, turn there, 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. I'm just going to highlight it uh, because I'm going a little long tonight. He, his first major miracle was he declared that it would not rain for three and a half years until he declared that it would rain again. And that was because Jezebel was, was leading and she had created rebellion. He wanted to show the power of God. And then he also, the second great thing that he did was he went to the Mount of Carmel and he challenged the prophets of Baal to say, hey, if you believe that God, your God is God, then you build an altar, an altar, place wood, place the sacrifice upon it, and you pray that that God would send down fire from heaven. They prayed, they prayed, nothing happened. And then Elijah said, it's my turn. He said, stand back. He built an altar. He rebuilt the altar to God. He prayed. God sent down fire. Not only did it burn up the, the, the sacrifice, it burned up the stone, the wood, and even it burned up the water that they had poured uh, an abundance of water and a trench around it. it the scriptures, it licked that up. Uh, chapter 18, verse 19 through 39. My intent was to read it, but we're, we're running short on time here. Uh, so 
a powerful, powerful scripture, powerful, powerful chapter. And Elijah, he, he, he has these two great victories, and then he becomes afraid of Jezebel. And we're going to pick up here next week uh, in 2 Kings. I, I hope you will tune in next week and uh, come with your, your Bibles, come with uh, your, your hearts and your minds uh, ready to receive. And I trust that uh, you receive something tonight. I trust that you got something out of this message, something that blessed your life and uh, gave you a new insight, maybe, maybe something you hadn't heard before, seen before. But we're going to continue to explore the depths of every book of the Bible. By the time this year ends, well, by the time we get through these 66 books, you at least, no one's not going to ever be able to tell you uh, you've never read the Bible through and you've never understood comprehensively what it means. Thank you again for your support in advance. And uh, hey, if, if this has been a blessing to you, you send in a love gift. Uh, put WB on it, Wednesday Bible Study, so we'll know what it means. And I, I, I want you to know I'm enjoying coming to you every Wednesday. Uh, it, it's 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 keeping me sharp, you know, you know, making me get back in get back in my 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 in depth study again, and uh, I'm enjoying it. So uh, I hope that that's coming across. And again, on behalf of Dr. Leslie and Pastor uh, Caleb and Dr. Natalie, uh, we all send our love. We want you to know we appreciate you and we thank you. And listen, spread the word, share what God is doing here at C3. Uh, on Sundays, as well as what God is doing uh, here on Wednesday nights. Great things are happening. Well, again, God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. We've been having some beautiful weather. I know the pollen is a little high, and uh, but uh, I'm enjoying it, and I uh, hope you do likewise. I'll see you Sunday. I'll be here. Uh, I, know I was out of town last Sunday, but I'll be here this Sunday. And looking forward to seeing each and every one of you. God bless you. Have a great night. And may the Lord richly bless you with his wisdom, his knowledge, and his understanding. Goodbye.